Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. So it's Christmas time. A time to appreciate and share the gifts we've been given. The AWA Library is a collection of gifts from many generous sources, including original inventors and builders of technology, and historians and collectors whose dream was to preserve this rich legacy for future generations. We are the keeper of their stories. Tasked with an enormous responsibility at AWA, we meticulously handle each item with tender loving care, protecting, cataloging, scanning, and preserving to promote and provide accessibility for research, knowledge, and discovery. Please join me on a journey through the library as we take a brief glimpse at the gifts we gratefully and joyfully, as a team, work together to preserve and share. If I'm going from A to Z, but we begin with numbers. And we do have a ton of books and catalogs and magazines and photos and archives, totaling over 33,000. And the numbers keep growing, which is a good thing. My, our librarian is my husband, James Cruiser, and assisted by a great team, a husband and wife, Caroline and Sandy. Sandy is also our registrar and heads the past perfect, past perfect effort. So we begin with A, and AWA has a lot of amateurs. And so we do have rows and rows of amateur books galore, including antennas, ARRL handbooks, and call books. The early ARRL handbooks offer not only the history, but provide an entertaining view of ARRL's beginnings. When we were trying to verify the owner of call W3RE, we were able to find confirmation in an early call book that, belong, that it belonged to Harold Robinson, the donor of the same DeForest Type O transmitter that was involved in the 2QR controversy. The 2QR story was in the last two AWA journals and the AWA library was instrumental in aiding the research for writing the articles. B is for books. And the Max Bodmer Library and Media Center and his contribution to Bell Labs. Max worked with the Bell Labs team to upgrade the traveling wave tube so that it could be used in Telstar 1 when it was launched in 1962. My husband Jim found the Bell Labs model of Telstar that hangs in the library on eBay of all places. Max loved the library in AWA and upon his passing, his widow had a crew pack and ship from Switzerland a Zenith Stratosphere and dozens of other unique European radios to the AWA Museum. And that Swiss packed package was pretty incredible. They did an um, amazing job in packing that huge radio to send from Switzerland. C, well, Crosley, we're Crosley Broadcasters, a, a fairly scarce publication, and we're glad to have it in the library. And we also have a lot of catalogs. Catalogs can be used to verify radio manufacturing production dates. To the right, the Kent brochures featuring Atwater Kent's first product are quite rare and may be the last existing examples to be found in a library. E for DeForest and donations. Gerald Tyne, who was the author of the Saga of the Vacuum Tube and Tube Historian, collected mainly tubes and their corresponding documentation. 
His historical donation comprises some of our earliest and rarest De Forest documents. And this is pretty early in 1901. for the electrician. Many early experiments leading to radio's development are contained in these volumes, which began in the 1870s with telegraphy, featuring early electrical and wireless development in scholarly articles written by inventors and engineers. The periodicals serve to inspire and influence the growth of communications. And of course, we did throw a little Marconi in there. That's uh, an early 1905 catalog. And the Ariel was one of his publications, an in-house, um, fairly scarce um, publication. And then every once in a while, you find some pieces of ephemera, which are brochures and publications like the SOS, they're sometimes one of a kind items that were fortunate to survive. And they often can provide a unique insight to the course of radio history. We have many research files. They include early radio station history, AWA history, and even Lauren Peckham's tube research. The rarest items are secured in fireproof file cabinets, which we have a number of, and they stay, they protect, and we're, uh, we're grateful that we haven't totally filled them yet, but we're getting close. Burns back many Kernsback's many publications and magazines inspired young amateurs to build and operate their own early wireless stations. Later, his magazines would serve to document the early history of communications from wireless to television and beyond. And one of his most um, common, I guess, commonly known was Radio News. And it extended through radio into television, and he had many other magazines as well, Radio Craft, um, Electrical Experimenter. Gernsback had many publications through his lifetime. History. Well, we got a little bit of H and a ham kit tips and Hewlett Packard's in there as well, which is more of an in-house publication, but we're fortunate to have it. Library collections provide links and connections to complete the missing pieces to the stories. Stories to share with the power to bring history alive for the younger generation and to accent future museum displays. The Institute of Radio Engineers formed in 1912, and the Institute of Electrical Engineers, which began in 1884, combined in 1963 to form the IEEE. With articles written by original inventors and historians, these volumes are incredible sources of history. And we took a look for Marriott's autobiography that was written up in the spectrum in the 60s and found it in the library. Journalists captured the news of the day at the time the events occurred. Saving documents such as these save stories that might otherwise be lost forever to history. This particular wireless telegraphy and journalism brochure reported Marconi's um, wireless used for the reporting the yacht race and is very scarce. It's been in the AWA library collection since before we were um, part of the library, before we even knew, probably uh, was something that had 
landed on Bruce Kelly's desk a long time ago. And Key Spark, I, th I think Rachel is on, which I'll be great. It'll be great for her to see how much we've been doing. This Key Spark is a great example of the importance of saving special collections. Created by Rachel Isbell Branch, KeySpark is a primary source historical wireless collection about Arthur Abner Isbell, call sign IAA, the fourth wireless operator in the United States. Arthur Isbell was Rachel's great uncle. She became fascinated with his story when she discovered and saved a collection of his postcards in the 70s. With persistent curiosity combined with her love of his story, history, Rachel preserved an incredible collection of postcards, photos, news clippings, and documents that provide a unique one-of-a-kind glimpse at Arthur Isbell's journey with wireless. Born in 1874, Arthur Isbell met DeForest in high school and was to work for him in 1902 as a wireless operator. He worked for Fessenden's company building a wireless station in Scotland and you can see one of the postcards from Scotland and the one of the towers, there's a photo of a tower that was in the collection that, that Rachel saved. And in early 1907, he installed and operated wireless for Massey on the SS President the first vessel of the American Merchant Marine to have wireless in the Pacific. AWA is grateful for Rachel saving and sharing this wonderful collection and is looking forward to using this unique collection to help spark young minds to appreciate history's early inventive heritage with her great uncle providing an excellent example. We're almost done with the archiving. Things have been put in sleeves and marked key spark. Um, Rachel had, I think, 87 postcards in the collection and everything's been archival in archival sleeves and archival boxes and labeled. There's um, the news clippings and documents are in sleeves and, and they're, in a fireproof file cabinet, um, locked up, secure. So we are very, very grateful to share a little bit here. Now our library has a purpose and a history, and we're here to preserve and share and, and even preserve a little bit of how it came to be. Bruce Kelly realized it was important not only to preserve museum artifacts, but to preserve the written history. His early collection included books, magazines, catalogs, documents, and stock certificates. It became the original library, but without a separate area from the museum. The early founders worked for Kodak, and Bruce took great photos and preserved Kodak moments, as well as early slideshows and recordings. Note the overhead camera and archival tissue between the pages of the WOR scrapbook. News clippings and scrapbooks are especially high in acid, and it's a major project to capture the content by digitization and protect them from further disintegration. M for Marconi, we do love Marconi. Marconi inspired the growth of wireless at sea, especially after the Titanic sank in 1912. Company catalogs and biographies can be found in the library to tell his story. Media is stored in another section of the library. Thorne Mays interviewed many of the early radio pioneers in the 60s and saved their stories. Thorne Mays also donated a recording of a 1934 station broadcasted interview of Charles Apgar, famous for amplifying and recording German broadcasts from the Telefunken Seville Long Island station, which led the Secret Service to shutting down the station 
and arresting a spy. And we're very fortunate under Marconi, we have um, discs that came from Charles Apgar and his original station license from 1913. That's in a fire file cabinet, all protected. Also in the media center, we have some quick taters. They're actually tapes. And many of those tapes, if you look to the right, our interviews that were done in the 60s. Thorne Mays was very active in trying to preserve history and he was able to interview some of the original historians and inventors. He's got uh, William Dubelier is one of them and E.B. Myers. So without his ac action to record the actual inventors and, and historians, we would have lost these, but we have a number of tapes that can be accessed in the library. And this, we wanted to put a little bit of our Niagara Frontier Wireless Association that's um, it, probably fairly scarce because we didn't have a, a very many of them, but we do have them in the library and, and captured a bit of a local history. We actually had Harry Houck show up at uh, one of our Niagara Frontier um, meets and, and recorded that. The old, old timers club included some AWA members and early history. Link Kundal, one of the founders donated his copies and it's kind of a fun read. Started out as the, the in 1961, they thought the blabber mouth would be a good title. And then there was a little controversy and they eventually in 1962 decided spark gap times was more appropriate. But it, it is a fun reading and a, a great insight to the early amateur publications. And then of course we have our OTBs. We were able to locate where the, the history on one of the tube exhibits by going through old OTBs. And finally in 1985, um, there it was. So I, I ended up taking that information and putting it with the exhibit and, and felt a lot better about being able to understand where it all began. We do take care to um, have preserve with temperature and humidity control and of course archival sleeves and archival measures. Popular Science was the first issue um, when was published in 1872 and it went to a digital format in 2020, unfortunately, to meet its demise last month. This publication served to inspire many young amateur experimenters to build and operate their own radio equipment. Sad to see something go that's been there so long. And then Past Perfect. It's a program that serves to organize, categorize, and preserve the original documents for future research capability and easy online access. Similar to museum items, library items are assigned an object ID. The cover and title page of each book is scanned directly into the database. Archives, photos, and other documents are scanned, labeled, carefully placed in archival sleeves. The rarest items are enclosed in an archival box and secured in a locked fireproof file cabinet. The library and museum database is continually updated 
mainly by Sandy and Caroline. Of course, QST, um, any ham knows about QST. It's been going for a long time and it's an ex excellent source for early amateur history. Quarter century, century Wireless Association, if you had already spent 25 years as an amateur, you could join the Quarter Century Wireless Association. We were able to find Harold Robinson's application and call history in the library. Radio Club of America's historical documents and proceedings are preserved at AWA. Organized and filed by Radio Club of America and AWA volunteer Ed O'Connor. A huge effort begun by Bob Hobday, this special collection is a great source of historical papers authored by original inventors, most notably Edwin Howard Armstrong. 15 members were listed in Dunlap's Radio's 100 Men of Science for their achievements as inventors and for contributing to the growth of science, technology, and communications. The club's youth activities program is 30 years old and uses amateur radio to promote interest to middle and high school students in STEM technology. And a college scholarship program encourages those studying engineering. The club was originally formed in 1907 as the Junior Aero Club, founded by Miss Lillian Todd, who believed in the need to advance the education of a group of bright young enthusiasts in their early teens. Miss Todd was the first woman to build an aircraft and apply for a license to fly. In 1909, current club members, including Miss Todd, changed the name to the Junior Wireless Club to reflect their new interests. The Radio Club of America continues to thrive as a club and AWA is grateful to preserve and share their great history. AWA is also the caretaker of the technical tube designs. It's a little bit be below and specifications from the RCA Harrison plant. And after it closed in 1976, AWA was invited to take any tube items that were left on the assembly line factory floor. Originally fo founded by Edison in 1882 for light bulb production, it was bought by GE in 1892. And in 1918, during World War I was used to produce radio tubes for the war effort. RCA acquired the plant in 1930 and began manufacturing tubes. The Harrison plant produced receiving tubes for military, commercial, and industrial application and was RCA's primary source of supply. The sale of RCA's receiving tubes met a peak in 1966 and after Solid State took over, is only a matter of time before the doors were permanently closed. And don't forget R for AWA review. Many of the early articles were written for the review using the library for their research. Sparks Journal is an excellent source of shipboard wireless operators accounts by the early operators. Written by Bill Brenham, Brenneman, he knew some of the early operators and he tells those stories in the Sparks Journals, which they, they started in the 70s and they're an incredible read, very enjoyable and uh, an excellent account by the guys that were actually there and still alive at the time. T for team. We have great team. The Macmillan 
couple, Sandy below in the middle and Caroline to the left and my husband, Jim, who's the librarian. They work so well together and we've even gone to see them in Hawaii and spend some time with them. But we're so fortunate to have a couple that dedicate almost full time their time to the library. Sandy has been working diligently to digitize and preserve each item in the library and is nearing completion of the time consuming but joyful Key Spark project. We are so grateful for our dedicated team. You know, Wireless has quite a story for being only a company for a short time. And it has links to Isbell and Key Spark. In 1906, Abraham White formed United Wireless to allow him to unscrupulously promote war stock sales. After transferring DeForest Company's assets, which consisted of 39 land stations and over 100 marine installations, he abandoned the DeForest Company to its creditors. Shortly after, C.C. Wilson took over as president. His signature is on the certificate, dated 1909. By 1909, stocks promotion efforts continued throughout and a stock perspective is shown from 1910 and that's on the left. By 1909, Arthur Isbell was working for United Wireless and remained with United Wireless until United lost their patent suit with Marconi. After the resulting merger, United Wireless and all assets was absorbed by Marconi and Isbell became his, began his employment with the Marconi company. Thorn Mays knew many of the pioneers and provides an excellent account of the early days of wireless, citing Isbell six times. So many discoveries in the library, so many incredible connections with wireless and history. The AWA Museum is quite possibly the only museum of its size in New York State run entirely by volunteers. No one is paid, but we have some great volunteers. And they come in and they just fall into doing what they enjoy. And, it, it, and everyone gets along. It's just an incredible group and we're very, very fortunate. And they all share the same vision to preserve and share the history of the technology used to communicate from the first telegram to today's software to find radio. We get to the W's and there's W-O-R. It's, as you can see that tissue is being put, it, that is a huge job to digitize, photograph, scan, place those sheets and Sandy and Caroline, uh, mostly Sandy. He, he grumbles sometimes, but he just gets right to it and keeps on working on it. And we're so grateful. Uh, we have the bookmaster from W6AM, Jan Perkins's book, was donated to AWA about Don Wallace. Wireless Age succeeded the Marconi Graph in 1913 and is an excellent reference for Marconi wired wireless enthusiasts. Even Charles Apgar was featured as the cover story entitled A Wireless Detective in Real Life in the September 1915 Wireless Age. I didn't find a lot on X, but the Crystal Set Society newsletter <laughs> fit the bill. So we have another publication that may not be um, seen anywhere else. In the Yearbook of Wireless Telegraphy, a Marconi publication, um, is an excellent source of early Marconi company history. 
YLRL, or the Young Ladies Radio League. It began in 1939 after an ad in QST about 200 meters and down stated that no women were mentioned. Her stories, the women who made communications history, deserve to be shared as well. And since 1939, the YL, the Young Ladies Radio League continues to exist and has a publication. Finally got to Z and we found, I found a, an assortment of items in one of the many company files. And in that Zenith story to the right, there is a history from 1919. So we continue to find history on all fronts. And I wish I could share so much more. I keep finding more exciting historical discoveries every time I visit the library. There's so much to learn and teach and share, and it seems like so little time. I was just at the library yesterday, and, and every time I go there, I look and I find new things and learn new things, and it, it's just so much fun. I hope that the, the, those that are watching today will get a chance to come and join us in the library one of these days. So where do we go from now? On Beyond Z, we do have a vision and purpose, and we're trying our best to preserve and share the stories that bring history to life. And we'd love to hear and share your stories. A closed book must be opened to connect with an open mind. In today's world, a library should be a sanctuary, a place of peace to inspire, to teach, for the next generation to learn. We're, we are working on new educational programs to teach and our out, outreach will be heading to the schools. The museum's displays and articles will be fe featuring more of the stories. But above all, we have resources. We have a huge library and dedicated volunteers. Without them, we would be sunk and it makes a great first step to the future. So all of us at AWA are hoping and wishing that you and your family have a peaceful and joyful holiday season. Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates.